And here we have what we saw over Puerto Rico, an asteroid strike that was seen basically the same, a couple of hours the same day before it came in. And uh, this was not very big, thank goodness, and it broke up into three pieces, but it was picked up on the weather radar, as you can see, credited by Dwayne Free of Goski Sentinel, animated by Frankie Lucena. And here we have it again on space weather. Small asteroid explodes near Puerto Rico, June 22nd, at around 9.25 UT, the small asteroid entered Earth's atmosphere and exploded in broad daylight south of Puerto Rico. Airwaves recorded by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Infrasound Station in Bermuda pegged a blast entry between 3 and 5 kilotons of TNT, which is a fraction of World War II atomic bomb. The explosion was clearly visible in images from NOAA's GOES 16 weather satellite, as we can see here. You can see, you can even see the trace, here you go, that trace line of particles coming in. The meteor expert Peter Brown of the University of Western Ontario says the infrasound signal is consistent with a small multimeter sized near-Earth asteroid. These are the NEOs that uh, NASA tracks. So this was a multimeter sized, what was it, 5 meters, 10 meters, 20 meters, whatever. According to data compiled by NASA's Center for Near-Earth Object Studies, asteroids of this size and energy hit Earth's atmosphere about once a year. That means it's rare, but not exceptionally rare. The asteroid fragmented as it ripped through the atmosphere, as we can see here. This infrared image from GOES-16 satellite shows the space rock splitting into at least three pieces. And, and this is the strip that we saw before. It actually comes from back here and goes all the way down. Now, many more fragments undoubtedly sprayed from the explosion, but the resulting meteorites are now at the bottom of the Caribbean, or in the case of dust-sized debris, floating on the sea surface. Samples would be very difficult to recover, of course. Earth is currently approaching the torrid swarm a stream of rocky debris associated with the Tunguska impact of 1908. We uploaded a video concerning this a couple of days ago. Astronomers are eager for the close encounter, which begins in late June, so we're almost at it now, and they can peer inside the swarm, that's what they want to do, in search of dangerous asteroids. This fireball, however, is not a torrid. Based on preliminary orbit of the fireball, it does not appear to be part of the torrid swarm, says Peter Wiegert of the University of Western Ontario. He says its orbit is typically of near-Earth asteroids which have escaped from the asteroid belt. Update, this asteroid may have been discovered shortly before it struck by an Atlas Project Survey telescope. Today's space weather, our solar wind is at 343.8 kilometers per second. The density is 11.4 protons per cubic centimeter. X-ray solar flares, A7, spot 2037 UT, January and June 25th, 24 hour A8, June 25th again. Noctilucent clouds invading the US yet again. Earth's mesosphere is still unusually wet. The proof was in the skies of the United States yesterday, June 24th, when noctilucent clouds appeared at record low altitudes for the second time this month. 
electric blue waves ripped and rippled over Las Vegas, Nevada, Joshua Tree and Pollock Pines, California, Salt Lake City, Utah, and Albuquerque, New Mexico, that far south. The American display followed an equally extreme outburst over Europe on the night of the summer solstice. Noctilucent clouds are not restricted to the Arctic anymore. Everyone, everywhere, should be alert for the next display. As we said, the small asteroid explosion near Puerto Rico was unexpected and is split into at least three pieces. It fell to the bottom of the Caribbean Sea. The update, the asteroid may have been discovered shortly before it struck by the Atlas Project Survey. All Sky Fireball Network, every night, a network of NASA All Sky cameras scans the skies above the United States for meteoric fireballs, automated software maintained by NASA's Meteoride Environment Office calculates their orbits. Velocity, penetration, depth in Earth's atmosphere, and many other characteristics. Daily results are presented on space weather. And today we had a network reporting 40 fireballs sporadics. In the diagram, the inner solar system, all the fireballs orbit intersect at a single point, and that is coincidentally Earth. The orbits are color coded velocity from slow being red to fast being blue. And we've had near Earth asteroids reported 1,983 potentially hazard asteroids, hazardous. The next one will be July 7th. A velocity of 12.2, diameter of 26 meters. Now, as we know, we have a solar minimum, so we have more cosmic rays bombarding the Earth. We've developed, they said, a new predictive model of aviation radiation called ERAD, short for Empirical Radiation Model. They're constantly flying radiation sensors on board airplanes over the U.S. and around the world to collect more than 22,000 GPS-tagged radiation measurements. And using this data set, they can predict the dosage on any flight over the U.S. with an error no worse than 15 percent. And as you can see, there is a hot flights table. The more uh, hours you are in flight, the more radiation you get. And the higher you are in flight in the atmosphere, the more radiation you get. For example, if you are at a um, low flight, Los Angeles, San Francisco, at uh, Flying at about, what, 16,000 feet, sorry, 24,000 feet, you get 16.3 of what you get at sea level. Whereas if you're flying at twice that altitude here, uh, let's find an hour, well, it's about this one here, okay? That's just about an hour, just about like this one here. You get five times the radiation twice the altitude, five times the radiation. That's amazing. And that's why, unfortunately, a lot of pilots and uh, stewardesses and stewards do uh, come down with types of cancer. Now, space weather balloons also fly through space, and they also monitor radiation. And as we know, we've had a tremendous increase of radiation, uh, stratospheric radiation, in the past five years. This is only up to April 18, but if you extrapolate the line, that means that the radiation since December of 2014, uh, if you add another year to it, that's about 25% increase in radiation. That's just amazing. Uh, they, it's it, uh, possibly because of the fact that we have a um, solar minimum and for some reason we also have um, 
uh, an increase of uh, a decrease of our uh, electromagnetic force. Now the data points to the graph above corresponding the, to the Renegar Fodser mix maximum lying about 67,000 feet above central California. When cosmic rays crash into the Earth's atmosphere, they produce a spray of secondary particles that is most intense at the entrance of the stratosphere. The physicists Eric Renegar and George Fodser discovered the maximum using balloons, and that's what uh, the method is used today. The radiation sensors aboard the helium balloons detected X-rays and gamma rays in the ranges of 10 keV to 20 MeV. Energy spanned the range of medical X-ray machines and airport security scanners. Now, why are cosmic rays intensifying? The main reason is the sun. Solar storm clouds such as coronal mass ejection sweep aside the cosmic rays when they pass the Earth. During solar maximum, CMEs are abundant and cosmic rays are held at bay. But now that we're in the solar minimum cycle of uh, our sun, this allows the cosmic rays to bombard the Earth. It's another reason that could be weakening. Another reason could be the weakening of Earth's magnetic field, which helps protects us, uh, protects us from deep space radiation. Now, why is the Earth's magnetic field weakening is another question that has to be answered. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.